Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks, Season 2, Episode 4, with myself, Ryan. We got Sam and we got Jackson. You alright? And please leave us a like, guys, if you like this episode. Also, leave a comment um, with some of your feedback and stuff. And as ever, please subscribe. Uh, on today's show, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry, what's been going on in the world of film. Um, then, Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing um, Nick Charles who is the filmmaker of B Documentary. Definitely worth a watch, check it out guys. Um, and then also, we're gonna be talking about remakes in film, and if they're any good, really. So, other than anything, over to you, Sam. So there's been a big old Disney shuffle. All the films have been moved around like crazy because of obviously COVID. Marvel films, the Black Widow was supposed to be coming out at the beginning of November, was Disney's probably biggest release of the year. That has now been pushed to May next year, which is the same date that it originally had this year, which of course then puts in effect every single Marvel film has been pushed either three or four months forwards. Because one of the things the studio system can't help but do is schedule things in when they're not even in existence. <laughs> so it's kind of like that's kind of shat on them, if anything. I, I, I've got to say I'm totally confused by all the reshoot. I find scheduling a nightmare anyway, but this did, I don't know what's coming out when anymore. Well, it's, I looked at the slate. Is coming out. For the, mostly, we're talking obviously here domestic as in America, just to make clear. And um, I looked at a lot of that slate, and a lot of it is just films you've never heard of and the hopes that things like June will be released this year. The one film which they haven't moved... I personally think this has less to do with the audience and more to do with having some conversation in the Oscar talk, is Pixar's new film, Soul. Soul was supposed to come out in the summer. It's still scheduled to come out on November the 20th, the same day as, hopefully, Bond will be out. So it's an interesting one because, again, Soul, who's that appealing to? It's appealing to, obviously, the Pixar uh, lovers, but also children. But at the same time... Pixar isn't as strong as uh, Marvel is nowadays, or a Disney remake or something like that. So I feel like this is more to get them still in the Oscar talks for animation, because they're not going to get nominated this year otherwise. There are some very art house uh, animations coming out, making a lot of love, and Pixar is obviously falling behind a little bit. Antonio Campos, who uh, recently did the absolutely brilliant film on Netflix called The Devil All The Time, fantastic film. This is actually a bit of TV news. He's looking to do a remake of Staircase, which the Staircase is a Netflix documentary, which Brilliant. is, yeah, is absolutely fantastic documentary. He's looking to do a series remake with Harrison Ford. A remake of the documentary? Or, yeah, so or like, like a, a live action. Oh, so like a, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, dramatization of it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, which is, so I, I mean. Harrison Ford would play the, the lead guy from... The, the actual staircase. Yeah, mm. yeah. I personally don't know if it's needed because the documentary is near enough perfect. But again, the director is very, very good. Antonio Campos, what he did with The Devil All the Time, After School, um, Simon Killer, Christine, they're very, very dark dramas. They get the best out of the actors. So to see him do a series based on one of the most acclaimed documentary series ever, could work. Uh, Tiffany Haddash, who... Um, probably misspelled her name, but she is an amazing comedy actress who pops up in a hell of a lot of things. She's been cast in the unbearable weight of massive talent. The only reason I'm talking about this film is this film is probably potentially going to be a massive waste of time or Nick Cage putting his skills to the best use possible. This film is about Nick Cage meeting the doppelganger of himself in the 90s and it's very meta and it's very much looking at his own career and how much he's fucked it. Or not fucked it, but does a lot for money and it just sounds like it could be a hell of a lot of fun so I'm keeping an eye on this it's actually getting quite a big release for a Nick Cage film as well so yeah it could be interesting we'll see just from what you've said it kind of gives me the vibes of um, being uh, John Malkovich but that's it and obviously Nick Cage did such great work on adaptation from um, Charlie Coffin and Spike Jones that you're kind of like all right he's going back into that stage of interesting things and Nick Cage always delivers something interesting at least and finally, Quibi is looking to potentially be sold. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because Quibi was a desperate experimentation from some Hollywood elite of Jeffrey Katzenberg, one of Spielberg's buddies who used to run his dream work, and it hasn't really worked, despite 
the reviews of the new content is getting stronger and better. There's a particular show called Wireless by Steven Soderbergh, which apparently reinvents how you can use that technology. It's that good. But it's not enough. This was the billions and billions, and it just has not produced that. Yeah. I have to honestly say, I've never even heard of it. Well, we've talked about it on the show a few times. Oh. Actually, we've, we've yeah. covered it from the, it's how relevant from it is the in beginning my of it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a bizarre idea of this seven-minute uh, you know, sections of film that you, you watch. And uh, I just don't see that there's an audience there for that. Yeah, there might be sort of wonderful creative reasons to, to try and format something in that way, but... The thing is, it becomes cynical from the very start because you're not thinking about the form of the film of the story. You're thinking about how can we do this in sections to get more people subscribing? Because as we know, all of VOD depends on subscription. So I don't know, like, Quibi should collapse. It should collapse. And the fact that they recently won awards at the Emmy for their short form, it basically just monetized, well, monopolized that whole entire short form Emmy nominations by having bigger names instantly. So I feel like Quibi... Sometimes you need to see those elitist attempts to try and do what the other VOD sites do collapse, and hopefully this will be the last we speak of Quibi. <laughs> yeah, on that bombshell. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> um, so actually, going back to Sam, he had the pleasure of interviewing Nick Charles, who made the documentary B documentary. Um, so yeah, over to you, Sam. I'm on Trash House Take with Nick Charles. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Sam. How are you? I'm doing good. I've had a good creative day. So, yeah, I'm doing good. Oh, perfect. Wow. What happened today? What you been doing? Just been doing some writing, but this is more about you than it is about me. So. Oh, <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> so what got you into filmmaking? <laughs> uh, well, basically, uh, I, I mean, I originally wanted to be like a musician. Um, but basically, like I was started, I wanted to do like music videos, but going through like growing up right around the time where I wanted to do music videos I was really into like trauma and I've been just watching the way Lloyd Kaufman filmed like after I discovered him I started discovering all different kinds of filmmakers like Roger Corman uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis and I just like the way they could just make a, a film and not worry about like the standard standards of Hollywood pretty much you know like they could just go and film whatever make it gory make it they could just do whatever they want, and it just kind of like made me want to do it. And um, you know, one day picked up a camera and started it. Yeah. You know? So would you say that like those would it be the craft in that way is more appealing than the particular stories or the particular stories you want to tell? Um, what do you mean, like the craft of like what just becoming like mm -hmm. uh, getting in like just getting into hands it, yeah, on just, from that? Yeah, just diving into the filmmaking side. Is that more important to you than? The kind of stories you want to tell, because obviously some people they approach the story before the filmmaking. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I mean, for, for me, uh, I mean, like, I, I tried to go to school, like, college at the time. Like, I'm I'm getting pretty old now, and they didn't really have anything. Uh, but I would recommend going to school. There's more schools out there nowadays. I I've tried to. I just I would write. I would start writing start creating stuff and then just try to jump into it. But it took, it took a long time until maybe like 2015 or no, 14. And, um, I just kind of jumped right into it. I just, for me, it was going out there just talking to anybody you can find. And, uh, Lloyd Coffin was actually the one that started it all for me. You know, I got a hold of him and everything kind of clicked from there. Cause this is it. B documentary was, um, before you did your short film bullied. So, uh, should we talk about B documentary? Uh, then yeah. we'll talk about Bullied. Yeah, yeah, B, uh, B documentary. So <clears throat> that started out because, like, I was trying to, like, I was always thinking about writing and just, you know, getting equipment, and I thought I had to like write first, and then like, or just have, you know, just try to do it all myself. And it turns out, like, you know, you can't do everything yourself. I'm sure you know that. Um. And one day, like, I started talking to Lloyd Kaufman on Twitter, and I just threw it out there. I was like, you know, I'd like to throw, like, interview you. And I was just going to go from there. I talked to his assistant, and she's like, yeah, he'll do it. And from then on, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to try, I'm going to try more people. And um, 
after I filmed Lloyd Kaufman, he's like, throw my name out. He's like, just go out there. It's like, hey, I just interviewed Lloyd Kaufman. You know, nice. would you like to do an interview? And I, that's how I came up with this B documentary because it, it's not everybody's doing B movies, and that's why it's called B documentary because it's not a big, it's not a big production that a B documentary. You know, so that's why I call it. That's why I call it that. But after I got him, you know, um, I tried Roger Corman. And I talked to his assistant for like three months and I was getting ready to go out to California. But unfortunately, like, yeah, around the third month, you know, I got an email saying, you know, he's, he's going to be busy. He was in production doing like Sharktopus versus Werewolf <laughs> for like the sci-fi channel. So he turned that down. But then fortunate, fortunately enough, though, I, I got to get Herschel Gordon Lewis on board next and went to Florida instead just went from there. So for you, like, being a documentarian in that sense, what was it like to interview those people? Oh, it was... Oh. Sometimes I sit here and I... Or like, if I just look at the stuff I've done for B-Documentary, and, or even just anything, I've, I've been doing a lot lately, but for, for the interviews, it's, it's nerve-wracking because, like, some of these people I meet, you know, I've looked up to them for very long time i watched their movies and you kind of get starstruck but like once i'm there you know i i just keep get keep it rolling but yeah it's, it's one of the most amazing experiences i've ever been through so how do you kind of approach it like because obviously every documentarian has their own particular style what was your thoughts of when when you start getting those interviews together and now you're on your third b documentary how, what was the style that you were kind of thinking would work best for it um, I just, you know, I just wanted to kind of keep it like plain and simple and more, you know, focused on definitely, you know, people being interviewed. I think with B Documentary 3, it's going to be more, more footage stuff. I tried that with the first one, but sometimes, you know, you got, there's so much, like say if I wanted to get a movie clip of somebody's movie, they don't personally own it like studios do. So like with Herschel, he gave me some phone numbers and we sat in his, in his room for a little bit and he gave me three phone numbers. Uh, I forget, the, I forget what the guy's name was, but I called him first. I went down the line of what he listed and he tried charging me like 75 bucks for a minute for uh, blood feast. That's a B documentary. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll call you back. I never call him back. There's no way I could afford that. <laughs> you know, it'd be like one minute long to see, you know, I ended up getting a hold of something weird video. I don't, you probably heard of them. You know, they're, they're based out of Seattle. They do all Herschel Gordon Lewis, all these like crazy movies from the sixties. Hmm. Um, I got a hold of her, Lisa, and she actually said, "Hey, use whatever you want. Just put courtesy of something weird video." And I did that, and you know, it, it was perfect. It kind of feels like with this sort of thing, you've just got to keep trying to persevere with it with trying to get, you know, because you, you want exactly. to get, like you said, those people that have meant <clears throat> a lot with you as a filmmaker and you grew up on, so you just got to keep on persevering. Yeah, it, it takes patience and, you know, you get nervous a little bit sometimes, and you, like depending on who you meet, maybe you don't get nervous, but I, you know, I kind of did. I had to fly around, I had to take a train everywhere, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of hectic at some times, but at some points, but it was, it was it's worth it in the end. And I have uh, Angela Tom, she's my girlfriend. She's been, she's been, she jumped on board for B Documentary too. Uh, she wasn't around for Bully, but um, she's been recently working on other stuff with me, like stuff with James Balsamo, uh, Kevin Walter. Who else? Yeah, we, we're actually pretty busy lately. That's excellent, man. Fun. Do you think, especially we're... during this pandemic? I mean. There's not a lot of freaking too. <laughs> you know, it's just like we shoot stuff and then like kind of work around other people doing it too. That's for the moment. Do you think with a B documentary after these three, you would keep going with it? Because there's always going to be, I suppose, different filmmakers out there who are just going out and doing stuff. Yeah, I've, I've you know, I've thought about it. I said it was when actually Neil Jones uh, and, me, uh, I think it was with Lloyd Kaufman actually during his uh, during our interview. I, I did say this will probably be my final one. I just I, I want to just keep I want to keep filming. There's no no doubt about that. I'll never stop doing that unless my heart stops. But I mean, I don't want to like drag it and just be like, all right, you know what? 
this is enough. I, I love it. And three's it's it's slow right now, like working on it because I can't go and visit anyone. Luckily, I have you, Tony Newton, Billy Pond, uh, Victoria Demar. She was in um, Killjoy. Uh, three goes to hell. We we have quite a few people already, and bigger names to come. Joe Estevez wants to be in it. I can't go out to California, and he he was going to come to New York, uh, but he can't leave. You know, obviously, um, Bill Whedon, he's, he's, a, he's another great guy. There's a couple more biggies that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. It's just a tough time to do it, but you gotta do what you can do. But I'm yeah, but to answer your question, I, I'm not, I'm not even sure. I keep saying this is my last one, but who knows? <laughs> I really do like doing it though. You know, it, it is really fun and it doesn't have to be like humongous stars or cause I like, I'll throw a mix in. I'll have, independent filmmakers and i'll try to get at least a couple big names in there but it's not all about names it's just all about people watching it and if they want to be a filmmaker they you can hear them watch them what they went through in life and maybe it'll help you out a little bit help me out you know i'm making the first one i i I learned a lot from it you know yeah because of course after that you um did your first short film bullied which we were lucky to have part of halloween hell night uh, tell us a bit about Bullied. Oh, Bullied. <laughs> Bullied was great. I, I love it. Um, so basically, me and my kids were just hanging out at the playground. and to me, it, was, it was like midsummer, and they know I do movies. And they kind of wanted to be in one. Not asking me. They're like, oh, I'd love to be in a movie. And I was just like, well, let's just do one then, you know? And we're sitting at, it was at a school where the playground was, and we were just talking about school, being bullied, and how I've been bullied, everybody does at some point. So I kind of just wrote it off that. Um, that was, it was a fun shoot. It was really fun. Um, everybody had a great time. The only time that wasn't really great was kind of near, I think, right, actually, maybe two days before the shoot, because I had, that playground was supposed to be full of kids. Um, everybody was okay with their kids being in a movie, but there was a, maybe like four or five that were like, you know what? At, right when I got to the story part of where it gets gory, that's when they were like, I can't have my kid in there. I'm sorry. And it turns out, and I just started getting a bad feeling. So the night before, I just kind of rewrote a bunch of stuff because there was going to be more kids being killed in it. It wasn't just going to be, I'm not going to try to ruin the ending out if anybody's, anybody else has seen it yet, but I, it was supposed to be a lot more bloodier than it was. Um, so I be, I pretty much went to the school with a bunch of papers that I almost I, I pretty much handwritten everything the night before, you know, because I knew it was going to be a problem when I went there. And it turned out a lot of people were no show. Um, the ones that did show up, it was great, and uh, we worked what we what we could, and it actually turned out pretty good. We were nominated for three awards at Severed Limbs Film Fest, you know, and we won two out of three. Yeah, I remember watching the award ceremony. It was pretty cool. And like you do have some real effective, cool. um, you have some really effective makeup, and some blood effects in Bullied. Oh yeah, no, it was great. Uh, Matthew Fisher, he, he was he was in charge of that. Um, even some, um, Marie Sullivan was a part of it. My ex-wife was there too. She was she was squirting blood around. They were filling the blood up. I forget, but like everybody, everybody had a part in it. You know, even if mothers didn't want to join or the fathers, they just sat aside sure the kids weren't running around screaming which actually that was the other thing i was nervous about working with kids i was like all right am i going to be like standing here and all these kids running around screaming fighting each other and they were actually perfect that's good that's it, it, yeah i can totally understand it i would never want to work with kids in that regards because it's just no. so many stresses <laughs> and pressures and i yeah but yeah it was stressful it was I like it but I, like i know my kids were going to be perfect and i was very proud of my kids you know my son nico he, he did great you know and he was nervous i could tell because like once that camera turns on you know like everybody kind of gets i get that way i'll get like oh shit okay the camera's on you know and then like maybe i might have to take another take or two and then all right i'm perfect my daughter she she but but back to my son he, he was he was great though throughout the rest of the day my daughter was great too she nailed it. She almost got uh, best female uh, performance for uh, Bullied for that Silver Lips uh, Film Fest. Yeah, no, yeah. She was very. She was neck to neck. 
So it was great. I was, I'm very proud of them. Yeah, that was a really nice um, being able to see all the films together and stuff. And yeah, like the Without Your Head um, yeah. Severed Limbs Festival. Yeah, it was it was a cool little thing, especially with the awards and stuff. It was nice. Because uh, was it Alexander? That was cool. Hawk? We had we had a back to back one. I'm sorry. Did it was it Alexander Hawk who won be, um, best Alexander Hawk? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, Neil was joking around. I remember him posting on Facebook, just saying, "Wouldn't it be funny if he didn't actually win his own award?" <laughs> <laughs> but no, he he did that because he's doing a lot of things, man. And he's 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 traveling. He's getting these big features. Mm. I was supposed to meet up with him at um, Lloyd Kaufman's Shakespeare, uh, was it Shakespeare sh- well, hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm? Um, but the week before, I was going to go down to New York. Um, the producer got a hold of me. He's like, look, they're shutting down the production. Everything's done. And I was bummed. I was, I couldn't wait. I was supposed to be like a junkie in the alleyway doing something. I don't even remember. But, but yeah, he did that. He's been doing a bunch of other stuff. So it was cool that people voted for Bullied. I was actually all like, oh shit, that's, that's pretty cool. Because he had three other ones that he was pretty good. And he's pretty good at what, he's a pretty good actor. He's a very good actor. I think with um, Bullied in particular, because there's that communal vibe and it's got that, cheeky sense of violence with having children involved but it's never too serious it's always kind of a good bit of fun that it becomes almost like a crowd pleaser in that respect and i guess from the general theme of being bullied as well it's always going to be a crowd pleaser when you see the bullies get what they're supposed to get the reaction is always awesome um i, I facetimed my daughter and when she first watched it and she had a big smile on her face and then when i got to the gory scene she just covered her mouth in shock like holy shit because when they were there, they didn't see anything bad. I mean, I don't know if you ever seen the video. Of, oh, you I well, maybe saw the picture of me holding her with a shower cap on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she did her hair the night before. I was like, no, we're supposed to get splattered with blood because she was going to school soon. <laughs> <laughs> so they brought a shower cap and we worked with it. And but yeah, her reaction was great, and um, we pre- we premiered it. No, actually, we didn't premiere it. We premiered it with you on Halloween Hell Night. But we did a screening at, in Providence, Rhode Island, and there was like four other films. Um, and once Bullied came on, they're watching, and then once it got to that part, the crowd was just, they were going ape shit. Like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> it's a good feeling when, you know, like, hey, we, we all did something right making this, so. Everyone did great. No, that's good, man. So what is next? You were saying you were doing some projects at the moment, but is there anything you're focusing on or is it just a lot of different things with what you can do with the situation we're all in? Uh, well, uh, three part, uh, B-Doc three is still in the works. It's in just, it's kind of put on the back burner for the moment. I'm trying to figure out stuff to where I can grab footage. I'd rather go see them and film it. But I mean, if this Corona shit doesn't go away anytime soon, I don't know when I could do it. And we did Victoria DeMar with Neil and, um, Angela was there too on Zoom. We did her interview that way. So if I have to do it that way, then fuck it. But as for as for B documentary, I'm I'm still that's just I want I don't want to rush that one. I want to make it perfect. Mm. Um, I just did a couple James Balzano films. Um, Catch of the God was it Catch of the Day two. That was out in California. I was I was there last October. He's like, oh hey. You want to be in a movie? He hit me up one night and I was like, hell yeah. So I went down to LA and we shot Catcher of the Day 2 there. It was just nice. released on DVD. That was uh, more recent. And, well, actually, no, that was, um, he did film that last year, but it's just released. He's doing like six other films. Um, the other one recently we just worked on for him was Killer Waves 2. Me and Angela, we we went down the street here in Boston and filmed some pretty cool shit and like an alleyway and made it work. So that, I, I think that's coming out soon. He just wrapped that up. Uh, the most recent one, uh, Angel and I and Kevin Walter, do you know who Kevin Walter is? I just see that he always pops up associated with trauma. He loves trauma. That's, the, that's, I know he's a, he's a very well. big trauma. He's, he's got a movie coming out for trauma that I'm in. Nice. And uh, we kind of met a lot, like before that, he, before he, he started, it's called Tower Rats, Kevin Walters' Tower Rats. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. And yeah. um, Lloyd Kaufman and 
Yeah, as every everybody should hear about it. If you like trauma, this is a uh, this is what you want to watch. It's coming out very soon. It's going to be out on trauma now. I'm not sure about like DVDs and Blu-rays just yet because trauma is not even working in the trauma building. They're all they're all working from home still, you know. Mm. But uh, yeah, so Kevin Walters movie. I can't wait to do that one. So why I was bringing him up was uh, we we're working on a film called Shroomed. Me and Angela filmed some last year, and we just kind of like put it aside and get back to it. And I see like Tony Newton coming out with the grime exploitation nine and ten. I was like, hey, I got something, and Kevin, he's going to work on it too. He's getting some people involved in it, and he's editing it too. Excellent. Angela did some filming. Her son did some filming. It's going to be fucked up. It's not going to be too crazy. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be on trauma now, so it's. <laughs> should be worth it yeah you know what you're going to be expecting <laughs> doing a lot of trauma stuff that. <laughs> well that's where that's where's that thing because you, you do do a lot of work with trauma and that's kind of where you start with B documentary like you said Kaufman helped you step into contact those people so it's kind of nice it's almost full circle right yeah it is and it's and it's cool because you meet a lot of filmmakers that way and if you hear a lot of people talk about trauma and their experiences, that's, a lot of people start that way. Look at James Gunn, and, and yeah. you know, they started there, and you just, it's a pain in the ass independent filmmaking, because, you know, you, I know it's, if you're the director, it's, it's it kind of sucks, and, and being the producer, because you're trying to do everything yourself, but in the meantime, when you look around, there's other people that will help you out with no problem, I, and when you first start making movies on your own, you start meeting people, and everybody will just, they'll help you, you know, you can't do everything yourself, I don't care who you are, so, so like um, look at Edward, he tried to do everything himself, yeah, yeah, or Neil Breen, or <laughs> Tommy Wasu, there's a whole list of people trying to do too much themselves, would you, um, I always ask this question, <laughs> exactly, uh, do you have any particular project which to you would be a dream project? So it could be like a particular franchise or a particular story, or just if you had a certain amount of money, anything could go. What what would be the story you want to tell, or document if it was a documentary? Um. Oh man, I you know there was, oh, that's a good question. Um, I've always wanted to do. I always wanted to make a movie in England. Oh, really? I always wanted to make a movie in England, like an old school like. Doesn't have to be Dracula, but similar to like the Hammer Horror. Uh. I really am a huge fan of that, and I used to live in England. I used to live in Oxford, like very long time ago, and I love it there. And it has that look, like you know, it's old school, it's, especially the countryside. And mm. It's just got a perfect look for like, you know, a good horror movie. And I, I would love to go back there. Um, I haven't been there since shit, 2002, but Jeez. I would love to go back. I get so much family out there, so it, that wouldn't be an issue to stay in somewhere, you know, but I would need some money to uh, to make that work. So basically, also with what you were saying, I, I would like to collaborate with other people that would want to work on that, maybe get something going, you know? Yeah, that's definitely something that you could probably try and get in some Kickstarter or, or Indiegogo, that sort of interest, because like, I always, I, from doing other documentaries myself and talking to filmmakers, Hammer Horror always comes up as either the first thing that scared them or the first thing that got them into, like, horror. So it's always an interesting... Oh, definitely. Oh, my God, Christopher Lee, you know, Peter Cushing, you know, all those guys. I mean, like, even, like, Vincent Price, I think, started a couple... Of, if he wasn't an Hammer film, he worked with them multiple times, but... Uh, those are the classics. Mm. You know, if you, you if you're a horror fan, you you've heard of Hammer. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. No, definitely, man, definitely. Well, I hope that I really hope that you can actually get that like moving forward in the future. And I really appreciate you speaking to us. Oh, hey, thank you for having me. Like, I appreciate you having me, and thank you for being a part of B Documentary Three. Which I don't did we say that yet? No, yeah, we did. We did mention it earlier. And I'm really happy that right, you perfect. asked me. Hey, I'm really happy that you saved the footage because my laptop shit the bed and I was like, oh my God, I got to call I got, I had to call you. I had to get a hold of Tony Newton because he, he was part of it. Uh, Billy Pond, luckily, it was saved on Dropbox so I could find his, but it was like YouTube and I was like, no. It's like, I hope they have it still. So if people wanted to check but out... it worked out well. Yeah, it did, it did. 
Um, <clears throat> if anyone wanted to check out B documentary, where where would they check that out? Uh, right now, um, okay, so if you have a Roku, Amazon, Fire Stick, Apple TV, if you download Avail TV, uh, the documentary section has B-Documentary. Um, and if you go to the short film section, actually, Bullied is on there too. And it's all free. You don't have to pay for anything. You just download the app, boom, it's all there. And there's a bunch of other independent filmmakers that you might even know or heard of. So you might even see them on um, Severed Limbs. Um their movies on there because a lot of people are all, they're all on that. Yep, I a lot believe of we filmmakers. we actually have films ourselves on there. The animals and the drug tours, I believe, are on there. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, so you know Phil, right? So yes. yeah, Phil Herman. Fantastic man. He's in charge of the whole avail. Excellent man. I will try and get one of their logos to appear on the screen right now. So we do a little bit of advertising for them. Yeah, you know what? I should have sent it to you yesterday. I didn't even think of it. And if if you look at if you look where like the advertisement says "Watch a Veil," it's it has bully cover on there too with a few other artworks. So excellent! I'll be stealing uh, that image in been, a minute. It's been cool. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us, Nick. Perfect. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. All right, hey you too, and hey keep in touch. And if you ever want to do this again, I'm always around, man. Excellent. We'll do, man. Speak to you soon. All right, Sam. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, bye. So thanks for that interview, Sam. Um, so our topic this week is remix. And we kind of wanted to understand and put the feelers out there, really, of, well, to see if remakes are any good or if they're not good and what kind of defines a remake. Um, well, we started off by, uh, you know, we, we were trying to work out what how to categorise remakes because, obviously, you've got... Um, so many different uh, ways remakes come about and ways that they come together, uh, different source texts and the way that way that different directors look at those. Um, so we ended up looking at uh, Thomas Leach, um, who uh, came up with a theory that put, put the uh, remakes into four categories. Um, so you had the readaptation, which is um, taking the original source text. So if you had a, a film... Um, that was being remade but the original film was based on a book that director might look to the book more than to um, uh, more than to the film in order to inspire that um, then you've got the update which is essentially um, trying to bring that film uh, from the context of the time that it was made into the modern era or using new technology um, or, or new cultural understandings um, it's like Batman yeah, yeah. For example, I mean, Batman's more of a, a bit, a bit of a mixture of all of them in some ways, and this is why it doesn't really hold strictly true each of these categories. But they are um, a good way to sort of be able to decipher it a little bit more. Um, and then you have our homage, which is um, essentially taking a, a, an original source text of a film. Um, and, it's like a love letter. Yeah, essentially, it's it, it's looking at it and saying like, oh, I I want to pay certain tribute to this film, but I also want to make something that's that expands upon it and makes it different. Um, and then you have the true remake, which is just a literal absolute remake. Uh, it, it it you know it might advance with technology like the um, Disney films where you had the uh, original cartoons being turned into live adaptations. Um, but at the same time, it won't uh, strictly change anything in the in the narrative. Uh, it still hits it beat for beat, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so we found this kind of interesting. I mean, like I said, it, these are really loose definitions because you kind of you can think immediately of films that kind of fit into two of those categories, maybe even three of them. Um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting starting point. Mm. I think um, it's also interesting to understand that remakes, and which is what we've learned, is that remakes, similar to franchises, they are designed to, to be consistent. So like mm. at the beginning of film, we did not have the ability to watch it back on obviously VHS, DVD, <laughs> or even watch it at home on you know, like your TV. That was not available to the 50s. So remakes were always there to be able to sustain those stories later on. Uh, two examples that we saw was The Carnival of Souls and... Huckleberry Finn, I think, yeah, as they were remade in the 1920s to distract away from the Great Depression in America mm. in cinema in its early form. So remakes have always been there to 
really for capitalist urge to keep those stories going and to keep people going in cinemas. Well, I think it's a bit more than that because, um, you know, the, the, the physical... Uh, the physical reality of, of film back in the day is that that film would degrade. That mm. you know you wouldn't be able to just continuously watch the same reel of footage, and so uh, they needed to remake these films in order to uh, keep a you know keep a, a, a market it. going. You know, keep to, yeah, exactly. Um, similar to how you know back in the, the well, still now plays are remade. You yeah. know, remade every single time um, by a new cast, but. You know, you're not going to be able to see that otherwise. Do you see what I mean? It is the thing. We have those types of remakes, and I personally have four in my mind kind of versions of remakes, as it were. You have the remake for technological reasons, so it mm. could be the makeup, it could be the special effects, it could just be the location. Uh, foreign language, so we, as an American audience, to try and globalize that interest of the film, we put it in the English language because people can't be asked to watch subtitles, or in the case with um, Departed or films like that, you're bringing it into a context they can understand more, but it's still the same elements of the story. The ring? Yeah. Mm. Um, then there's the capitalist reasons to make money. Lots and lots of money. That's where most remakes go horribly wrong because they forget about what worked in the first one. Or, it might, or there's also that revisionism, which then again applies into that idea of looking at how we are as a society and going, oh, that didn't really work back then. One of the examples we were looking at was um, West Side Story. West Side Story takes elements from Shakespeare with uh, Romeo and Juliet and modernly contextualizes them into what was happening at that time with the gangs in um, New York, if I'm correct. Which is interesting because then the new remake that Spielberg's working on has decided to ditch any of this context and just do a direct remake of West Side Story instead of realising that it was a remake and trying to do things a bit different. Yeah, which is funny because Romeo and Juliet itself was a remake. Um, yeah. So it, it, it continues. And I think that's the thing is with we, we have this tendency to think of remakes as being this new phenomenon that yeah. is um, you know, somehow ruining classic films for us. But this is, I, I think that the idea of remaking goes to the heart of artistry and, and, and creation because you're always basing something that you're making off something else that you've mm. seen or that you've experienced and so it's almost impossible not to in some way remake at least the ideas of something or you know without being direct I think yeah that's definitely true in a lot of films that get remade but if, if you take Disney's example of it right now like I think The Lion King was 94, if I'm correct. Yeah. So you're talking, what, near enough 20 odd years, maybe just over 20 years, and then they go and do a live action. It's like, it's unnecessary. There was no need to do it. And like we said before, it runs beat by beat to the, the animated version. That to me felt more of a, oh, we're going to earn a quick lot of money off the back of yeah, and they earned so a successful. Lot of money. So Just, much money. How much was it? Well, it was like 1.8 billion. <laughs> It's ridiculous. <laughs> the, the thing is with those sort of remakes is it is all of the, who's the, who's the audience for those films? It's the nostalgia kids. audience and the kids. The kids who will happily watch the cartoon ones. There's no reason why not. But to keep them thinking of those characters as opposed to whatever new characters kids are being you know around more. I don't know what modern children's cartoons they love. But you know what I mean? Like it's There's so many. It's, it's taking those away and go. Remember the old ones that we created. And then giving a couple of little changes, but keeping it solidly the same for the nostalgia people. It's think, a horrible system. And it's and it's interesting because obviously, in terms of an audience reception of, of remakes, um, I think it's it, again Thomas Leach who said this that um, he argued that uh, an audience goes in with this sort of sense of masochism that they are they're gonna they're gonna see a film that they want to be live up to the original but they already feel like it probably won't and so they're watching it with this sort of duality of like hope and pessimism at the same time um, which I, I think isn't really a, a constructive way for an audience to go into a, a film sometimes no. unless you're deliberately trying to play off that. That, that's the funny thing, because when you apply that into horror, like there's always a negative expectation of a remake immediately. Mm. Despite the fact that some of the best horror films ever made are remakes. Yeah. It's a very weird thing that people don't seem to click onto. Mm. But then there are those remakes that, the shot by shot, or the ones that think that they've worked out what the core elements are and have forgotten what the elements that actually worked were. 
So um, one of the directors who's been remade a hell of a lot recently is Paul Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven did Total Recall and Robocop. Two amazing films that are completely satirical, violent, extreme, and make you think and have a reaction. Whereas the remakes are soulless <laughs> corporate creations that all they focused on was the dystopia element. Yeah. It's funny you say that because apparently in the works at the moment there is a Robocop TV series. Yeah. But Robocop isn't actually in it. See, that actually sounds like a good idea. So they're kind of going off the Gotham sort of idea. I know it was slightly deviating, but... Well, that's the thing. It's, it's finding a new way to tell those stories. And in a weird way, that's actually the best thing they could do with Robocop because one of the core elements of Robocop isn't Robocop. It's the fact that they create Robocop to serve their needs. So the prequel series, from what I've heard, is all about the evil corporation who are behind the technology. If you remember, there's a giant robot at the end of Robocop. It's the guys who did that side of it. Which is more interesting than just going, we'll tell you how Robocop became Robocop. And it's like, we'll just watch Robocop. It's very <laughs> clear in Robocop. But Paul Verhoeven had such a satirical manner to what he was trying to do. And most of his films are kind of like a dissection of American Hollywood blockbusters as they were by using American blockbusters to do that. Mm. So you can't really do that as just going, oh, I like that story, so let's just do that story. The thing to remember, of course, Total Recall is an adaption from Philip K. Dick's book. So you can understand from that side. But again, it didn't really re reference anything in the book. It was more just, let's make the same film, but let's do it for a younger generation. That's the other thing with remakes. When it comes to those big blockbustery sort of um, films, sometimes the, the target audience, they think, has changed. Yeah. And um, we were saying about this earlier, like, one of the things with franchises is, is that they get watered down as they go. So Robocop, again, is a perfect example. There was a kids TV series of Robocop. There was an animated series of Robocop. Robocop, as the first film, was an 18 certificate. Yeah. So when you bring them back for the new generation, their mind is to go, okay, make it a 12 so we'll hit everyone and we'll just take out all those bits that people actually remember and loved about it and filter it into a softer approach by just playing on the... The bigger fantastical ideas, I guess. That's why I think the motivation behind making um, a, a remake uh, or remaking a film. Um, <laughs> making a remake? Is that like yeah. three remakes? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, it is all about the motivation. I think if the studio is behind it, and I remember making this point recently on this podcast about some other topic, um, but I think if the motivation comes comes down to, oh, that did really well before, let's remake it, let's make more money on it, then you're going to see something a little less soulless and a, a, a little uh, soulless, and you're, you're not going to get that original... Uh, content that, that that made it something special that made it appeal to you, and I think the example of that things like that is um, uh, you know the difference between say um, the Fly and the Omen remake recently yeah, you know yeah. that was oh, it wasn't recently it was about two thousand six yeah, yeah ten years ago at least um, but uh, yeah that kind of that kind of difference it, 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 you can see it on the screen you can feel it as you're watching it because there's no love and care for the for the original text as always it comes down to the creator's intentions like mm. you said and when it comes down to director's intentions what Cronenberg did in particular with um, The Fly is he, he modern textualized it sure and he used special effects to his advantage but he made a more well-rounded character in Rundlefly he made him create more empathy towards it rather than focusing on the grotesquerie because he, the romantic love story is very strong in that film. Mm. And he was trying to talk about what was going on um, with disease and elderness in the 80s now as being ignored and stuff like that. So I think it's interesting that um, so many remakes, they don't let the creator decide. So if you're announcing your remake of Nightmare on Elm Street, that's not exciting. Whereas if a director or a creative studio, let's say, Bloomhouse or Spectre Vision, someone like that, said, we're remaking Nightmare on Elm Street, you go, ooh, that could be more interesting because they have a love for the craft. It's not a soulless machine like What's-His-Face kept doing in the 2000s, Michael Bay, when he remade Texas Chainsaw, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. Mm. They just kept the things they thought worked in that film but took away the danger, took away the artist, Michael took away... <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Michael Bay is just there for the money. What, what, and you know? I, I didn't... I, I... I think that that's the thing is you 
when you when you take sort of a source material and you and you want to want to remake it you if you're going to remake it in the current times or to do something like that you need to make it a comment on the current times as the like as the original source text was um and so like that's the that's like the difference between um uh, the original fly when was that made 56 yeah so that that was probably talking more about um nuclear weapons science, and, and yeah, yeah science yeah. and things like that um whereas the later one did feel much more like it was talking about um the uh, aids epidemic yeah, in, yeah. in the 80s um and and that sort of like that re contextualizing is really important to make a a, a good remake that that uh, surpasses the original film or, or holds true to the original film. It's funny when you say that though, because contextualizing is one thing by looking at modern world and stuff, but if we look at two of Martin Scorsese's uh, remakes, Cape Fear, The Pirate, pretty much the same stories through and through, but because he decides to do them and you know his kind of style of filmmaking, the kind of actors he's going to bring in, and the crime worlds that you already know that he's very much infatuated with, by doing, in particular with The Pirate, Mm. It's the same story. It's just putting it into a more, you know, we know what the crime world of Boston's like because we've all seen hundreds of American TV shows or dramas or, or if you're American, you know what the crime li like there anyway. It's still about that same sort of core idea. But you know the history as well. That's it. Scorsese has his own history attached to it. So when he approaches a remake and does it that way, you're more welcome to it. You're more likely to go, okay, this is a story I want to see because it doesn't matter if and again, because it's a foreign film, you're probably not going to watch the original. You're curious of how it could be contextualized as an American text from someone who knows the gangster genre. Mm. And I think that's the core thing. If you know that genre so well by proving it with your own work, then it should be okay to do it. When Gus Van Sant remade Psycho, he did it shot by shot, and everybody hated it mm. because he didn't do anything new with it. And it, it's not like he was a horror master either. He was doing, you know, he, Gus Van Sant does mostly indie dramas. So for him to dive into that and just go, I'll do it shot by shot, it's a loving homage, people are like, why? Mm. And, that, and that's the other question that always comes out with a remake. Why? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, that, that, that's sort of from the most cynical perspective, but often remakes sort of uh, the way that they're marketed um, puts you in that sort of pessimistic um, a mindset that the film is not going to be as good, especially the way that, and I don't know, it's a, it's an interesting discussion how um, so many celebrities um, and, and massive names will end up in remake films. And, you know, you've got to wonder whether that is because the original film was successful and so it attracts those bigger names that want to do something and go back and replay those characters. Or is it the other way around in that the studio... Uh, fears that if the remake it hasn't got some big names then people are just going to think well why are you doing that um, and so they need those names to sell it. You mentioned about the marketing and stuff I think one thing that's very interesting just off the top of my head and from experience of watching remakes is whenever they within the marketing they actually mention something about the original you know they they effectively glorify it in a certain way I always find then that because they've taken notice of the original, it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. But I never think with like, especially with Disney stuff now, they never really say anything about the original. It's kind of like, oh, it's the Jungle Book, mm. the live action. It's like, oh, okay, cool. But you're not mentioning uh, that. I think that builds a lot of pessimism towards well, it. I think it's a need to like, uh, like reject the previous text in some way rather yeah. than to celebrate it because they because they need to again justify the fact that they're making it in the first place um, and, and instead of leaning on it and saying well we love the, the director and the creators love this film so much that they want to do their own version of it they've got to say well that was in the past but the reality is that you know the as we were saying earlier about the um, film itself degrading the physical uh, fact of remakes needing to be the case in the early uh, in early cinema. Um, nowadays, you can you can watch something back side by side uh, if you wanted to, if you you know were that invested in it, uh, and so that sort of takes away that element that it, you can always appreciate the previous text. So you have to make it starkly different. I think it's an interesting one because you're right, and when it comes to like like Ryan was saying, how they sometimes take a remake and they can't help but hero worship the original. I think that also comes down to how many times has that particular material been adapted. 
Mm. So we look at um, Total Recall. Total Recall's original, what was it, Schwarzenegger, and in the remake you get Colin Farrell. Mm. You're instantly creating comparisons there by a whole different brand. It's of not what... Sylvester Stallone. No, it's Sam Schwarzenegger. The original. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Good. The is the whole. Um... Oh, I can't back. remember any phrases now. You fucking spun me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously, in that particular time for an action star, well, it was all testosterone, big muscles, showing all that. And the attempt with Total Recall reboot was to go, nah, this is more, like, slick. Mm. We don't need to have the big muscular guy that doesn't really fit in with the world. We'll have a more real guy, like Colin Farrell. But you miss what makes that work. And I feel like if there was another remake of Total Recall... That second one doesn't exist anymore. It goes back to the original. It all depends on how well the original done. It's the same thing with our favourite film that we never stopped talking about, The Thing. Yeah. <laughs> no one really remembers too much of the original. No mm. one really wants to put, pay attention to the prequel. It's the one in the middle, John Carpenter's one. And it was because it did the best with the text. And I think that's the thing. Sometimes you can hero worship the original, but if there's a good couple of versions, you probably also got your own distinct favourite version of that story. Going back to the Disney thing, Jungle Book, for example, the remake is actually pretty good for one. Yeah, it is actually. How <laughs> many like times <laughs> has the story been remade outside of Disney? Mm. It's constantly remade. There was a 90s version, I think there's one in the 70s, there's TV adaptions. So when you have these multiple different adaptions, you can easily remove the original. Whereas when you've got stuff like Total Recall, there's only two versions. You're instantly going to think of well, which one was the better one. Clearly the original. So would you consider Get Carter to be a remake? Well, there was a remake, wasn't there? It was well, Stallone. Yes, yeah, Stallone's the one. But what they do in it is it kind of... They, they said it was kind of like a remake, but it's more of a sequel. But it keeps all the original context to it from the original. So that's a weird one because it is technically a remake... But they've kind of... Because I think even um, Michael Caine had a cameo or something in it. That's it's, another thing, isn't it? It's that it's either the attempt of a reboot, a spiritual sequel, or a remake. They can all blend into one. And one of the key elements is, you're right, you bring in an old face from the other films. To almost pass the torch. That's yeah. the whole point mm. of it. Get them in there so if that film's a massive hit, they're ready to establish those new characters and ignore the old characters. It doesn't actually work. It rarely ever works. I mean, they tried to do it with Indiana Jones for just as in a sequel sense by getting Shia LaBeouf involved. They thought they could pass the franchise over, but because it's Indiana Jones's franchise, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. Whereas, um, I know I'm talking about sequels here, but Blade Runner is a good example where it does work, where you can pass it over. I think it, it is an interesting one where studios don't like to say the word remake because they know that people hate remakes, or they have an instant distaste to it. It probably is that... That's again thing. where it comes into the marketing. They don't have um, homage what had come before. No. And sometimes that's a bad idea, because some films that they decide to remake, there was talk for a long time that they were going to remake Videodrome. I was yeah, going to mention that, yeah. actually. Did it ever get remade? No, because it made no fucking sense. <laughs> they wanted to remake a film that's about like the psychology of sex and the things that are to do with what we aren't supposed to see and experience and all these extremes and tie it into nanobots, which yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with the, the core material and people have just rejected the idea completely. And the fact is, again, Videodrome isn't a massive... It's a cult film. And cult films don't make money. So if you remake a cult film, you're already remaking it with an intention, you, well, you should be thinking at least, this isn't going to make money. This is a homage to a film that I really loved when I was younger. Mm. Uh, like, you know, Suspiria would probably be quite a good example of yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, I, I haven't seen the um, new Suspiria um, we saw a bit film. Of it. Did we? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I, I I get the feeling from that because of the length of the film, because of the uh, trailers that I've seen, um, that 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 he the director really took the original text and and ran with it and did something uh, expanded upon it and and felt like it felt like he he really loved the original film um, and it wasn't supposed to be kind of a replacement for the original film. And I think that's, that is key. Yeah, it comes back to the list we were discussing earlier. That's a homage. Mm. It's got more in touch with that homage love letter for the vibe where it's like, I don't want to fuck the original material. Mm. I just want to have my turn on telling that material. 
I think what's really interesting is, and I think you maybe touched on it briefly earlier, Sam, is <clears throat> when you look at it specifically to genre, I think that also can sort of predetermine whether or not the remake of that film is going to be any good. Mm. Because the first thing that springs to my mind is whenever I've seen remakes of Western films, they always seem to be like perfect, or near enough perfect yeah. compared to... Because one that massively springs to mind is like True Grip or 310 to yeah, Yuma. Yeah, yeah. 310 to That film was one of my favourite films, the remake with like uh, is it Russell Crowe and um, what's his name? Christian Bale. Yes. Um, yeah, and that, that to me was just absolutely brilliant in comparison to the original. Well, again, is that, is that contextualising? Again, like, Westerns have a very certain audience who love it, and if you were making a Western where it's a remake to it, you're playing more to a homage rather than just being like, well, we've got to make this directly exactly the same because we need to make money, because Westerns don't make money. Mm. And it's that I think it's that understanding that the audience are coming in with uh, a certain e set of expectations, um, a certain set of sort of cultural understandings, yeah, yeah. Um, whereby they they may have seen the original or they may are probably aware of the original if they really want to you know really invested in seeing this um, this this latest iteration of it, um, and so like. Uh, yeah, I think good remakes kind of play off that. They play off the fact that you you have that kind of set of iconography that, that the audience will understand, and so you can make those those brief sort of moments of homage to those those films um, that only really um, are understood by the people who love the original film. But it won't be taken out of. Uh, uh, to audiences who haven't seen the original film, they won't be lost in it. It won't be a moment where they're like, well, what the fuck was that about? Where's well, the know? other side as well? It's also to, to not be overwhelmingly shoved the original in your face. Mm. So I know, again, the film we talked about quite often, but Scarface. Scarface is considered to be one of the greatest remakes ever made because most people don't remember it's a remake. And it takes a lot of those scenes that you saw in the original 1933 film and just recontextualise them. So like the use of the Tommy gun becomes grenade launcher the use of the dialogue but what Scarface did so well is that it really hit the zeitgeist of what was happening culturally in the 80s at that time which that story needed and that's why when they talk about doing another Scarface remake there shouldn't be an instant reaction of oh god it's gonna be terrible it's like well contextually can it work right now of course it can mm. it's all about the corruption of the American dream and that's what those films serve so beautifully and I feel like Weirdly, you could see four or five remakes of Scarface every 20, 30 years. It's always going to be relevant and important. And that's where remakes can work in that favour, that they can, those stories and those ideas are always relevant and not just, let's bring them back because people forgot them. Um, going back to the cultural um, misrepresentation stuff, it's not just foreign cinema in regards to subtitles. It's those bigger ideas that they think can carry over to the West, but don't. So Japanese anime is a good one. They did the Ghost in the Shell remake. Nobody wanted that. They had been trying to remake Akira for like since the first Akira. And the first Akira came out, well, there is only one Akira, in 1988. And it's, it's a perfect anime. And they want to remake it to modernise it and put it into an American context. But there's just a question of why. A lot of these films as well, other films have already stuck, took bits from it. We've said it before the Matrix. Matrix is an, is an accumulation of lots of different philosophy and ideas, as well as anime. Mm -hmm. And they've just taken it and turned it into a new thing. Well, it's interesting as well, because uh, you mentioned Westerns earlier, um, and obviously a lot of the spaghetti Westerns came from um, Japanese, Sam Japanese samurai, samurai right? films, yeah. Um, and so you'd think that they would have, they would be able to look at that and you know look at, at the way that they want to adapt anime and think, well, how did we do it back in those times? And obviously there was, you know, quite, a, they they obviously essentially ripped the context uh, totally apart from uh, from the narrative and and uh, reassembled it in a way that the Western audience would um, historically appreciate in in a different way. Um, uh, whereas, like uh, like you said, with those, it feels like they're trying to make them directly. They're, they're trying to re just remake them for a Western audience, and sometimes you need to go a bit further than that to hit that cultural point. This is the thing. The other thing they can do, which is very poisonous, is they'll look at culture. What's working right now? What are people really interested in? Can we find an old film from the old days and remake it with that in consideration? 
And it rarely works because it instantly becomes outdated because you're so desperate to focus on what is happening in society at that point. It's not looking at the sociology of it. It's not looking at the psychology of that time. It's looking at, oh, well, everybody's using these kinds of technologies. So if they're using all that, but we just remake them to do exactly the same story, people will love it. And they don't. People, we, we, we have a weird disconnection with what is supposed to be legacy within film. We respect the films that exist in the time, and sometimes we can't even understand that there could be a good remake out of it. Or there's the complete opposite of you won't even acknowledge the idea of a remake because the version that you know is the only version. And it's, it's hard, I suppose, for a studio to work out where they're going to make money when you've got such a determined audience. So you trick them, like Disney does so well. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the original point. Do you guys think remakes are any good? Are they good for cinema or not? Oh, that uh, I think I I have a, a real love for um, taking something, uh, taking an original text and and changing it, making it your own. Like uh, I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's it's something like um, you know. Uh, Mediocre borrows, genius steals, oh, yeah. and and I think that 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 rings true with remakes because when you really take something and you make it your own, um, it, it 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 can add something to it. It can really like uh, advance that conversation, and and you can you can push things forwards and progress onwards. Um, whereas if you are just borrowing the ideas and you're not trying to reimagine them or rethink them, you just end up with the same product, um, and it, it doesn't it doesn't ring true to the original because there's not the passion there that the that the original had. So you, you see what I mean? For me, remakes are essential <laughs> to cinema. They're they're part of what the history of cinema is. They're part of keeping it going. Whether it's good or bad, it's hard to say because it's in the creator's eyes. But I think about, because um, we've talked recently about what films would we want to remake. And there's two films I'd love to remake. MS-45 by Abel Ferrer and uh, <laughs> Society by Brian Neusner. Two fantastic films that one of them doesn't even need to be remade because it's just perfect. But I just want to have my own version of it. And the other one, story's not great, but that general major theme... Yeah, the so concept good. of the society is, is amazing. But That's um, it. It's, it's that concept and going, well, I really want to take my own spin on it. And as a creator, like you said, we have the right to do that. We're allowed <laughs> to do that. We're allowed to look into it and go, right, what can we take and do our own story with? Yeah. Or what can we do with those characters? That is important to cinema. It's just the cynicalism of capitalism that drives it more towards... Profit not, making. Yeah, not caring, just doing the same shit but throwing someone who's famous or a flavour of the month at that particular time. Cool. Well, what's your, what's your opinion? What do you, yeah. what's your, <laughs> you always I ask think, us questions, yeah. we never throw it back <laughs> at you. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, I had to, well, if I tell you, I have to kill you. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with Sam, really. I think that it's it's kind of interesting to think that if we didn't have remakes back in like the 40s 50s you know 30s 40s 50s 60s where would film be now like mm. would there be more original like original content i yeah. highly doubt it mm. but if we didn't have remakes film i don't think would be as strong as what it is now yeah, yeah. um because legacy is everything isn't it um so without remix, yeah, I, I think we wouldn't be where we are now. Probably wouldn't be having a podcast chat about it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I just I don't I like I think remix are important, but I don't like when the idea of a remix is taken completely out of context just for making money, because mm. it really takes away the craft of what remix originally were. So yeah, that's what I think. So um. Guys, hope you've enjoyed the podcast this week. As ever, please leave us a like. Give us a little comment if there's any sort of remix that you loved um, or didn't love. And uh, please subscribe. Check out the website as well. It's www.trasharts.co.uk. And um, keep an eye out for some new content coming out soon. Other than that, Trash Arts Takeout. Ta-da. Bye.